here already. It's 9.30. Um, I was just having a chat with our guest. I mean, 9.30 on a Sunday morning is kind of prime spot for long runs, isn't it? So it's kind of ironic. I've got an ultra endurance legend in on a Sunday morning. But anyway, uh, apologies for that time. It's something we might change in the future. But anyway, um, even if you can't join us live and you're listening to the podcast, then I've got a very exciting guest up for you. Once again, as always, um, last night was pretty much no sleeping at all because I'm just dying to get talking to um, Elizabeth Barnes, who um, I'm going to bring in very shortly. For those of you who aren't aware, Elizabeth Barnes is probably most famous uh, wins are the two Marathon de Sables in 15 and 17, but there's plenty of other stuff she's done as well. Um, and I'm very excited to bring her in now so we can have a chat to her. So without further ado, we'll have our three, two, one countdown. And a bit of luck. Du, du, du. There's Elizabeth. Morning. <laughs> Good morning, Matt. <laughs> so nice to hear you. <laughs> we lost sound like, about the 10 seconds and apparently my eyes just jumped out of my head yeah uh, anyway brilliant so nice to see you so first of all just for people watching the video a little competition here uh, one of the backgrounds behind me and um, elizabeth are real and one of them's fake so i'll let you guess answers on a postcard there we go actually they both look fake yours looks so beautiful it's like that's got to be fake <laughs> That's amazing. Where are you? I mean, I'm in clinic. I'm, I'm in yeah. Where are you? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Gran Canaria. So uh, Gran Canaria is my office for about two weeks, uh, which is really nice. So, uh, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful back then. What do you do? This is for your training camps, is it? Yes, yeah, so I'm coaching at two training camps. They're organized by Sandra Amdahl, my fiancé. So he's a Norwegian uh, ultra trail runner. And um, he has run camps in Gran Canaria for quite a few years now and uh yeah i'm helping him out as a coach so we have uh two camps start on tuesday so yeah should be really great we have a mix of people from scandinavia and uh the us oh, fantastic and these are mm. people predominantly why have they come to your camp what are they training for so some of them will be training for trans gran canaria which is a big race here in gran canaria in uh, february and some are just maybe interested in, you know, developing their trail running skills or learn more about ultra running in general. So a bit of a mix. Fantastic. And how did they, because we'll talk a bit more about your camps later on, but how did they get onto your camp? Was it advertised somewhere or if people are interested, then how do they find out information? Is it on your website or? So for these camps, um, I have to say it's it's uh, a lot to do with Sondra's network and um and his advertising and then uh, after this we're going to Lanzarote and we're going to coach at a one week long camp in Lanzarote and that's a multi-stage uh, training camp specifically geared towards MDS so that's more marketed in the UK so people from the UK might have seen that it's um, it's with Ian Corliss the photographer yeah. yeah, I think I think we've heard about that one. That's good because I mean we we're, again we'll talk about this later on. But on this kind of podcast, as soon as you say something, my mind just goes right. New question. Forget about the format. <laughs> but like a lot of it's ironic. Well, no, it's not ironic because a lot of people have heard of Ian Corliss, whatever running they do. But I was surprised that when I was kind of advertising this, I had to say Elizabeth Barnes, comma two times winner of Marathon de Sable. It's like people, your name wasn't famous enough for me. And I was kind of having yeah. this thing, how oh, do you know this person? You're a runner. And yet they'd listen to Talk Ultra. They were aware of Ian Corliss and the fantastic photos and stuff. So it's like, well, let's get onto it now. Why, why, without, why aren't you well more known? I mean, you've, you've, you're, you're a champion. You're a world champion. You beat, you came first, obviously, in the 2015 and 17 for women. Um, but then in the 17, no, in the, in the 2018 uh, Ultra Mirage, you came fourth, nearly third out of the whole event, mm -hmm. beating I don't know how many guys. So what yeah. is it? Yeah. Why aren't you a common household name the same as Kim Kardashian? What's going on? <laughs> I, I don't know. I might be in Tunisia because I think I went on the national TV there. All uh... <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess it's uh, ultra running is still, you know, an, an extreme sport I and mean, it's growing but it's it's kind of a niche sport and we don't get any any airtime you know on tv or in 
newspapers, you know, not not very much anyway. I mean, I've been I've been in an article in the Guardian, I've been in some running magazines, um, I've been on numerous podcasts, and that, but um, yeah, I guess I guess it's uh, there, there's so much out there to compete with, you know, and we just don't get that that time. So much rubbish is what you yeah, think. So much yeah. rubbish. <laughs> it's crazy because there's not even an ultra. It's not even about the running. It's just about, particularly with female athletes who excel, because we have the Olympics once every four years, and suddenly the poster girl is somebody um, like um, Jessica Ennis or something, and she's everywhere mm. for a week. And, and you kind yeah. of see the interest raising, and probably girls are thinking, I could be like her. And then that's it. They disappear. Or with the Paralympics, you know, you get Richard Whitehead, who um, we've had the pleasure of meeting, and we went to watch when he got his 200 metres. For a week, he's like a huge star, and everyone's like, I want to do some charity. I want to give some money. I want to support these people. And then just disappears because the media moves on to something else. I think it's mm. such a shame. Um, if I yeah, was yeah. at the BBC, I'd have you on reading the news every night. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. But, but, you know, you raise an important point because I think it's really, it's really important for girls and women of all ages to, um, to have people to look up to, you know, to, to realise what is what is possible um because if you don't see something you might not know that it's there or or that you can do it and you know i came into ultra running quite late in life and and i remember you know seeing and reading about mimi anderson for example who also started late in life and that was a you know a huge inspiration for me because i was like well okay if she can do it i can do it because i felt I have to admit, I felt quite old when I started, you know, in my, uh, was I mid to late thirties, you know, um, and, uh, and to actually, um, excel in a sport at that age is, you know, it's not something that maybe you do in other sports. And so you just simply think you're too old for sport, you know, <laughs> at least competitively. Um, whereas in fact, you know, you're not. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, then again, it seems to be, this was a question I was going to ask later on, but is ultra running something that for some reason, I don't know if it's physical or mental, that kind of 30 plus women tend to excel at or are able to kind of get into and do well at? So I know a few athletes who have turned 30 plus and they're suddenly going into these kind of um, ultra marathons and actually doing quite well. And people are going, wow, you should really have a go at this if you haven't trained for this. What is it about 30 plus women, do you think? Well, I mean, this is a totally non-scientific. Obviously, it's more of a more maybe an, an an opinion based on what I have observed. But I I think that women are probably quite mentally strong, which you need to be in this sport. And it seems like endurance develops with age. So maybe you get slower, but but you get you get the endurance and. Women are also actually, I think, if I generalize, maybe better at pacing themselves than men are. Um, so I think uh, going long is just maybe something that suits that suits women. But you know, the sport, the sport is getting younger, um, and I think we will see change over the coming years. And you know, whilst it has been sort of. Well, not necessarily easy to be an older runner. Um, I think it has been easier than what it will be um, as the sport gets younger. Yeah, no, that's interesting. No, I'd, I'd, even as a guy, I'd have to agree with um, a lot of what you say. And it ties in with even at marathon level, here we see an awful lot of marathon runners. Um, and when you look at the kind of six, seven hour marathon runner, it always amazes me. It's almost more impressive than the person who does the sub three. Because imagine how many times that voice in your head has gone, what are you doing? You've got people yeah. sweeping up and walking past you, and yet you're still. And the majority of these people are women, which is not a, a go at women. It's showing that the mental ability just to keep going, keep going for seven hours over that 26.2. I mean, that's, that is testament, isn't it, to just not giving up? Absolutely. Uh, and if you take a race like the Marathon de Sable, for example, you know, I, uh, you know, I ran it in 23 hours something last time, and then you will have people who do it in, you know, 80 hours. I mean, that's that's just incredible, you know, that that's a that's tough, tough race. race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite famous. 
Which brings me on to, let's talk about the Mariners stuff because there's plenty of other races you've done and you've won. Um, but I think, I'm kind of thinking for the market who we're going to kind of be listening today for the average runner, um, a good entry to what you do would be describing the Marathon de Sable because they might not be aware. So give us a brief breakdown of what it involves. Sure. So so for those who are not aware, the Marathon de Sable is a 250-kilometer long race in the uh, Moroccan Sahara. It's uh, what, what in ultra running we call um, a multi-stage race. So you don't run the 250 kilometers non-stop, but you run it in stages over seven days. And in between these days, you have a, a campsite that you stay in and the campsite moves every day. Um, the race is also self-sufficient. So that means that you have to ensure that you have everything you need for the whole week, um, except the water which you're given. So it means that you carry spare clothing, um, you carry some compulsory sort of survival gear, and you carry all the food that you're going to eat for the entire week. You know, you don't get given any food. If you want to cook hot food, you carry your own stove and your fuel. So um, people started the race with, um, between say six and a half and 15 kilos um, of weight and you run with a backpack um, every day so that's kind of the the race in a nutshell I suppose of course it's extremely hot you run in a lot of sand but another terrain as well and uh, yeah it's interesting because it's it's of course about the running but it's about so much more you know it's about the friendships you make during the week it's about facing you know maybe unexpected challenges um every day and so um it, it's it's so much more than just running what what do you think entry point would be then i mean because i sometimes criticize and i criticize i try and guide marathon runners who are coming here for their first marathon and they haven't done a 10 mile event yet or maybe they haven't kind of gone for even a half marathon. And I kind of say, do them first. Don't enter. What's the entry point for a marathon to Saba, for example? What do you need to have done if you'd need to have done anything? So I, I, I coach a lot of people for marathon to Saba. And I, you know, I get people on the whole spectrum from having done almost nothing to being quite experienced and having done um, quite a few ultras before. And, um, you know, I think it all depends on how much time you have, you know, if you, if you decide in January that you want to do MDS, you know, in, in three months time and you've never run five kilometers, I think, you know, it's not a good idea, but, um, but if you start to plan well in advance, say, you know, a year before and you say, okay, I would like to do the Marathon de Sable and, and all you've done is maybe run 5k, maybe you're not a runner. Uh, can you do it? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. And but but then it requires a structure, you know, you, you don't go from, you don't go from, you know, nothing or 5k to, to the Marathon de Sable, you, you, you break it down and you set interim goals and you, you know, you gradually, um, I guess, break down your mental barriers, but also improve your, your physical um, ability and fitness. And I guess given the characteristics of the actual course, the race itself, the, the temperatures, the sand, do you need to have experienced that before you go? Is, and how would people prepare for that? Do they need to go and do a training camp near the area or is there some way you can prepare, for example, people from the UK? How would they prepare for it? So the more specific... Uh, the more specific training you do, the more specific experience you have, the better it will be. Um, but the race, of course, is, um, is a huge financial commitment. So not everyone can afford the time and the money to go and do other trips in addition. But of course, um, if you can, it's great to try and run in the heat and um, on technical terrain and on sand. Um, so, for example, the training camp we do in Lanzarote is really popular. You know, it's um, what we do there is we we take people out for a week on trails that are very specific and it's a mix because Marathon de Sable is not just sand, it's sand, but then it's um, stony plateaus and rocky trails and um, small dune fields and things like that. So it's, it's, um, it's a lot of different surfaces and, and if you can't uh, replicate them exactly, what you can do is you simply get out and run off road. I think that's really important because it's uneven. So, so 
a mix of running on road and off road. Uh, running in snow is great, actually, in the winter. Um, it's a great way of simulating sand and that kind of really heavy going. Um, and then the heat is super important. Uh, so you can acclimatize the heat and there's a lot of science behind it. And, and typically I, I recommend that people start about three weeks before the race. And, you know, you can do it in various ways, but um, you can go into a heat chamber if you have that available. You can do hot yoga. You can, you know, dress up in a silly sweatsuit or extra layers and <laughs> go out running or go on the treadmill in the gym. You can take hot baths after training. So there are a lot of things that you can do. And if you do that, it's going to make a really big difference to your performance um, because there are adaptations happening in the body that just simply makes it a lot easier compared to not being acclimatized at all. Very interesting. Yeah, some, some great points there. Um, so, yeah, not the whole course is in sand, uh, but you... And it's interesting because you kind of looking at your history and your CV, which is just anyone who hasn't been to your website, just looks at your running CV. It's just you've got to laugh. It's just brilliant. It's like set course record, winner, course record, course record. It's like <laughs> what was everyone doing before 2015 when they just walk in these courses? It's amazing. If anyone needs information, <laughs> just go to ElizabethBarnes.com. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. But um, you, you excel in sand running. Would that be fair to say? That's where you kind of... Yeah, I, I seem to be pretty good at it. It's, it's a bit ironic because, you know, I'm from Sweden, so. <laughs> but, yeah, I seem to like sand and, and hot weather, yeah. So I remember, I think I was listening, I, can't, I think it was one of the um, Talk Ultra Ian Corliss' podcast, um, but it was talking about the the difference, the different demands placed on the body when you are running on sand, particularly if it's quite fine, loose sand. Because in here, in, in Stride UK, and you've been down here, we've looked at gate analysis, but obviously running on a treadmill, you've got that recoil, which you talked about in the, in the podcast. You've got that stuff. That's what running basically is based on. It's a spring. You land, and the more force you put down on the ground, the more force um, you get back, transfers elastic mm -hmm. energy. Of course, in sand, you're kind of missing that rather important element. So you're having to pull your legs up. So it's working totally different muscles. Yeah, it's uh, it's right. You know, you're right. You don't get that same recoil. So I guess you you can tire quite quickly, and it's a different way of running. I I think that um, maybe why it works well for me is that I I have a a reasonably economical um, running form, um, and. Uh, and then I, I think I run fairly light. And I think when, when you run in sand, you have to try to be light. I always say to people, think that you are light. You know, it's really important. Just imagine that you're really, really light. And then you land light, you land sort of midfoot, which means that you don't dig into the sand. That's really important. If you take a heavy, you know, if you have a heavy stride and you land either on your heavily on your toes or, or worse on your heel um you're going to sink in um and it's going to be much more effort moving forward so it's it's about almost trying to float float on the sand it's like don't disturb the sand no yeah, yeah, yeah. no it's all great metaphors it's great you can tell <laughs> your seasoned coach because it's finding the metaphor that works for the athlete in front of you so yeah um that's amazing and in terms of strength training because again with a with a runner landing on harder ground and it's all about driving back hamstrings and glutes and but I guess when it comes to sand then you are looking at quads and hip flexors because there is a certain amount of pulling that leg up mm. do you yeah, and you're, exactly. you're quite a fan of strength training or you've been through different phases in your, in your in your experience where you've put more time into strength training and seen the results or where do you stand with yeah <laughs> yes I've I've, uh, I've done it in phases I would say and um I think it's uh, I think it's very beneficial, uh, actually. So so for I mean for ultra running and for multi stage self sufficient in particular, yeah, I think you need to be quite strong, uh, generally and then particularly in your core because you know you're running for a long time and you're carrying weight. So you have to maintain a good posture because a 
as soon as you start folding in the hips, leaning forward, maybe putting your head forward, you know, all of a sudden your form goes out the window. You're actually carrying a lot more weight than you would be if, if you were running more upright with a good posture. So I think that's, that's really important. And to be able to sustain that for, form over many hours and many days, you need to have that core strength. And then in terms of leg strength, um, I mean, it would be interesting to hear your perspective as well, but I think if you do um, a strength training focused more on like max strength, you you uh, recruit you recruit more muscle fibers than maybe you would do if you didn't do that at all. And I think that can come into great use when you when you're running as well. So I mean, I've found it beneficial um, for sure. And I did a lot of strength training before my uh, second MDS win in 2017. Mm. And what were some of your go-to exercises out of interest? Was it particular exercises you found more specific for your needs? or I did various types of uh, squats and lunges, mostly core training and um, some uh, dips, some pull-ups, you know, some, some really um, exercises that capture large muscle groups. You know, it's not like I went to the gym and did, you know, a bicep curl. It's like completely unnecessary for a runner, right? So... <laughs> Uh, so fairly functional training, um, capturing big muscle groups. Yeah, although I think I remember you talking before about maybe there's a little bit more um, relevance of training the upper body when it comes to um, kind of the, your sort of races because you're carrying the backpack and you're having to pump those arms. You, you know, like you say, it's not all yeah. about having foil. Yeah, no, and I think that's where things like dips and pull-ups and push-ups, um, and maybe shoulder press, um, some back exercises come come into play, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I guess the backpack, which you mentioned before, makes a massive difference as well. To the extent that I think I remember you saying that. I mean, obviously, you're elite. It doesn't come more elite. You're the winner, but you even changed the type of elastic you used or something because it was a little bit lighter to try and make a difference on your backpack or. And then well, that last <laughs> you know, I go to I go to extremes uh, because because every every gram counts when you when you run. And I think I did some I did a little calculation. I mean, like there's more that the more, there's more that comes into it. But if you assume that you know with every step you actually lift the weight of your backpack, you know, if you add a 500 grams extra, you're you're going to end up lifting a small car between every checkpoint. You know, it's it's a it makes a big difference and you certainly feel, you know, 500 grams. So um, I I went through all of my kit and I, and I scrutinized it and I said, okay, where can I save a few grams? Because a few grams here and there, you know, add up to something in the end. So I think the elastic was about my sleeping bag. So a sleeping bag has uh, typically has an elastic in the, in the head ends, you know, that you can, you can pull tight when you sleep. And I, I took it out and I replaced it with a very light non-elastic cord because elastic is is quite heavy, relatively speaking. Uh, <laughs> and so that took my sleeping bag, you know, from maybe 200, I know exactly, actually, I'm such a geek, it's from 252 <laughs> grams to 239 grams. So <laughs> I think that's, I think mentioning the elastic is, is uh, I'm, I'm hasten to add anybody there considering ultra running yeah forget about your elastic there's other things to concentrate on maybe but it's yeah just this is to... not like this is not like basics this is like advanced yeah. level <laughs> but... day one of lanzarote but you know, no, do but your it's... training first and then worry about cutting elastic yeah. <laughs> but in terms of winning and being elite it just shows the attention to detail um, that particularly you show. I mean, if you're caring about your elastic in your sleeping bag, then obviously you're caring exactly the same about everything else and going down to the more important aspects. Um, do you think yeah. you need to be a bit of a geek? Do you need to be really, to be at the level you are? Does it help? I think it helps because it means that you have the attention to detail. Um, and... And when I went back to MDS in 2017, I said, okay, how can I, how can I repeat what I did in 2015? How can I win again, knowing that the race had become, you know, more competitive? Um, I, I had to look at everything, you know, it was about marginal gains. And, and you know, you, you, you can't just leave something to luck. You know, you have to know that you have covered every aspect where you can make improvements. And that's your, 
training, that's your, you know, heat uh, climatization, it's your kit, it's uh, what's in your head. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. You can't, you can't ignore that. If you want to win, you have to look at everything. Mm. No, I true. guess it's a, it's a sort of, it's, a, it's, it's some kind of obsession, I suppose. And I can't maintain that obsession 100% all of the time. And that's probably good. You know, then I need time when I focus on other things in my life. But, but for a few months in 2017, I was, yeah, very obsessed with MDS. <laughs> and, but you actually took some time off to and changed your training a little bit. Talk to us about, because, um, yeah, what are some of the changes you made? Because obviously you came back in 2018 at the Ultima Mirage as kind of a, like a test run, but you ended up winning the whole thing and coming fourth, or winning as a first female uh, finisher and then fourth overall. Do you put that success, which was a huge success, down to changes in your training or what do you put it down to? Um, well, so what happened was, you know, going back a little bit, I, I, I have to be honest, I've pushed my body um really hard for a few years not just with running but with a lot of other things because i made a career change from consulting to uh, running my own business becoming a, an ultra runner and i did a lot of things in parallel and i worked really hard and and um and the body can cope with you giving it you know a tough time for a while but then you can't do that forever or i mean i couldn't anyway so so um, towards the end of 2017, or actually it started earlier in hindsight, but, you know, my body just said, you know, hello, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I don't like it. And so, um, so I got really tired and, and, uh, and I could tell that my immune system was pretty shot because I was getting ill all the time. And so, um, I, I had no choice but to take a break. And so I, that's why I canceled MDS 2018 and, and the other races I had lined up and I, um, and I made a plan for how I was going to declutter my life from other things that was going on. And, uh, and I, and I took a break and, and I really took a break. So for example, in, um, in March, I went to, um, a little surf town in Morocco for four weeks and I did pretty much nothing except sleeping and sunbathing and cooking good foods, you know, um, mm. And uh, then I started running again very slowly. I just did, you know, what my my body said was okay. So that meant maybe eight kilometers three times a week. You know, that's that's what the body could handle, and that's what I did. And then if I had a bad day, I just slept. If I had a good day, you know, I did some something. But um, I let the body decide, and I think that was hugely important. And all of that time, I had Ultra Mirage in September as a as something that I was committed to, um, and and I think it was good because it was something that was manageable and within reach. Um, and at the same time, I knew that if I wasn't ready, I wouldn't go. But but it was good. I think it was a um, it was an appropriate goal. And. Um, so, so I guess the changes I made was I really listened to my body. I allowed myself proper rest and I changed my diet to a um, plant-based diet as well. Um, and I uh, sold part of my business um, to free up my time. Uh, so so um, yeah, those were probably the, the big things that I did. So there's, yeah, there's so much in there for all runners with the idea of just listening to your body, knowing when you're overdoing it, taking time off, being able to take time off. Did it take long on your four week surfing, sunbathing holiday to disconnect or were you kind of lying there thinking I should be out running or what was it like? No, you know, what was really great actually was that I went to a place where nobody runs. So, mm. uh, so people there, they do yoga or they surf or they just mm. there to chill out. And, um, I think that was really good because I just didn't see runners. So there was nothing to stress about, but also yeah. I had, you know, I had sort of decided that it was okay to not, you know, to not worry about things and that I just needed a break. And of course, you know, 
of course you worry because you know I worked I worked very hard to be able to switch my previous lifestyle to the one I have now you know so I live I live off of running so of course if I can't run it's a worry because then you know eventually I'm gonna have to think about well how am I going to make money you know what am I going to do to support myself and that so there was maybe some something um like that in the back of my head um but I try to just you know not not worry about it um and give my body the time it, it needed and and actually I have to say that that has been an immensely um useful experience um and i have had people that i coach in in similar situations and and i think unless you unless you have been so tired that you can't even you know be bothered to get off the sofa i just don't think you can understand what that's like and and so i think it's useful like being able to bring that experience into my coaching and i can see maybe when people want to do too much or they get ill or you know they're overreaching and 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 i understand the dangers of that and i can help people navigate through that so um so that's been good you know as as much as of course i would have rather been without you know that that period i think it's been it's been a useful experience yeah i mean that was going to be my next question but you've you've already answered it in the terms of (laughs) having experienced that you can now explain that to your athletes as well you've been there you know it and the message is going to be you know that you mustn't overdo it otherwise this can happen and and then the benefits yeah. of taking time off yeah yeah and and what's really important in this as well i think is that actually it's it's not really to do with running it's to do with what's going on in your life as a whole and and um you don't have to be a runner for something like this to happen you don't even have to be an athlete you know um and I think a lot of people have a tendency to maybe separate, you know, running and exercise from other things in their life. And, you know, you see people with stressful jobs and, you know, kids and they, you know, wake up at 4 a.m. just to fit the run in. And, and you know, and I'm sure you know all about it. But, um, and and, and um, the body doesn't know the difference between stress from running and stress from work or stress from you know the pressure of family commitments it's all stress um and i think that's really important to understand that that you have to look at all aspects of your life and find that balance and the, you know i get a lot of like i said i get a lot of people coming to me for example for mds training and they go like yeah you know i i work i work really hard around my own business you know i work like 60 hour weeks and then Oh, and then I have the kids and, you know, and then, and then they go like, oh, and I guess I need to run like hundred mile a week from the And I'm like, whoa, you know, because a lot of people also, I think, uh, look at maybe what elite athletes do, you know, they go on Strava and they go like, oh, so-and-so is running hundred mile weeks. And, you know, I have to do the same. I want to be as good as them. But you have to remember that people are full-time runners. Like they, they sleep a lot and they have, you know, more time to do what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's it's totally it's brilliant what's coming out of your mouth. It's so true for so many runners. The whole stress analogy, that realizing because it's so easy to get your shoes on and go out that door if you've had a stressful day or you haven't slept well or you've been drinking and out partying. You think I've got a shift that now, so I'm going to go out and do a really long run. And people mm-hmm. like to say don't realize that you've only got kind of one glass of energy of water, and every time the kids screaming, the relationship problems, the late nights your run's not going to fill that glass up. It's just going to empty even more. Yeah. During it, it might feel great. The endorphins take over. But when your brain does its calculations in your nervous system, you're going to be even more shattered. So, yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, I'm, I'm hope everybody listening, everyone who listens on the podcast, <laughs> takes heed of this. Because, uh, <laughs> frankly, we get a bit tired and sick of saying it here as therapists. So if you don't listen to me, listen to Elizabeth, please. I understand. No, it's great. Um, what else you said? So, oh, yes. The what was the um, motive for the plant-based diet? Was that something you read about, or? And also, my other question is, what do you keep clicking? Keep clicking. <laughs> yeah. What are you fiddling <laughs> with? <laughs> I actually have my laptop in front of me. It's completely unnecessary. Oh, it? But then I can hear this kind like... of. No, I can hear this kind of. <laughs> no, that might be. That, I'm not doing that. Maybe it's the microphone. Maybe. Oh, I'll maybe it's that. I maybe I'll try. Maybe I'll try and put this cable in my face and see if that helps. <laughs> oh, I thought you were fiddling with something with your hand, that's all. No, 
No, no. we'll try that. We try it. Could be the it could be the jacket. We we'll try that. <laughs> that'll be that'll be fine for the podcast. Um, yeah, not quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, go for so the plant based yeah. diet. Plant based diet. Um, <laughs> yeah. So when I when I got ill, so basically I got tired. I had had a I had had the flu. I got tired. I you know I just kept getting colds and things. I started to read read up about nutrition and health. I mean, I've always been really interested in nutrition. Um, nutrition is a very complex topic, and there are a lot of opinions, a lot of um, research of not very good quality, a lot of kind of tribal thinking. Um, so it's actually very, very complicated to, um, I think, get get a proper understanding of what might be healthy and what might be less healthy. And the media is not helping. Um, but I started reading some very credible studies that have been made on um, on uh, the connection between diet and um, and disease you know like cancer heart disease diabetes um, all kind of sort of common things that we see in society today and um, the evidence was quite overwhelming that a plant-based diet can not only prevent but actually reverse a lot of these diseases and that um, many of them have a very convincing um, link to animal protein. So uh, I have always or had always been a big meat eater you know, for those 41 years of my life, probably ate meat a few times a day, almost every day. Um, but with that information, it wasn't actually very difficult to to switch. So I decided to eliminate all animal products from my diet um, and be very strict with it because I didn't want to make exceptions in the beginning because if you start to make exceptions, you're not going to establish you know, the, the habit. Uh, so, so that was the motivation for it. And you know, when I started, things started to happen. So um, I started to feel a bit better. I got some more energy. I stopped snoring um, because actually, particularly dairy products are mucus for me. So, if so, for any snorers out there, maybe try and um, eliminate dairy from your diet for a while, <laughs> see if it helps. Um, and uh, of course, I did some blood tests as well. So, they, you know, it wasn't just like, okay, I'm a bit ill. I, I actually. I actually did some some blood work that I had as a basis for this, and I found out some interesting things you know, about my. I had some high cholesterol, and I had um, elevated mercury, for example, and and I realized that I've been eating a lot of fish, and uh, maybe growing up a lot of fish from um, the Baltic Sea, and which is high in mercury, and so um, so that was very easy for me to eliminate fish as well. And then once I had done all that, you know, I I, I read up more about plant based diet and you know then you come into all other things which is you know the environmental impact of animal agriculture which is absolutely shocking um and of course animal welfare and that so uh, yeah with everything you know in hand i kind of thought well this is definitely the right way to go and it's it's been good um it's been good and i've been sort of um pretty strict i've had uh, maybe um a few cakes in nepal and i've been eating uh, a few eggs to actually boost my cholesterol a bit but other than that it's uh, been 100 percent plant-based okay so um i seem to have disappeared from the screen can you still hear me i can hear you i can see that my my picture has turned sideways 90 degrees and i look very odd um i don't know if that's actually how it comes what? out on the screen or not. No longer here? hold on let me just have a quick play around apologies for this anyone listening Okay, are we back? Yeah, the I question just... is, but where did we where did we get lost? Where did we <laughs> where, what did I just sit there and uh, no, verbal on uh, to what myself? Yeah, 
Um, yeah, that oh, was well, weird. We'll never know, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> until, we, until we look at the recording afterwards. <laughs> that was strange, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, I think there's a there seems to be a movement. I like to think there's a movement away from eating so much, particularly red meat anyway. I mm. think, well, I don't know, I'm from Brighton, as you know. So, I mean, here there's already quite an aware kind of travelling yeah, uh, just cultures, different cultures here, and, and a lot of people are just thinking: one, we eat too much meat for health reasons, and two, as you mentioned, just the welfare of animals, um, the, the amount of meat that's produced and available, and it's just you only have to Google a few times to realise you don't really want to be part of the dairy industry, or you mm. don't want to. It's, oh, it's terrible. So um, I've I moved away. Uh, when you said I wanted to be strict from the beginning, that's exactly what I didn't do. Um, it was my intention, but I still eat fish. Um, yeah. But then yeah. you've just said you discovered your mercury levels are too high. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe by just eating so much tuna, for example, it's my go to. I'm, I'm probably in the same mm. boat. So I'm suddenly feeling really unhealthy. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you one. can test it. You can test it and, then, and then you'll know for sure rather than yeah, making yeah. assumptions. But but I, I I think it's I would say I think it's fairly common probably these days that a lot of people have, have elevated mercury levels and it's you know it's not healthy and it's not so easy to get out of your system. So mm. so continue to accumulating is is probably not not great. That's a, you know it's it's associated with various complications like Alzheimer's for example. So <laughs> oh sorry, I just forgot where I was. <laughs> Happens to Actually, me all the time. Oh no, I don't even <laughs> joke about that. My memory is just awful. Oh no, let's not go down that road. Jesus. Anyway, let's move on to something else. Um, oh no, I was going to ask about mental preparation. That's going to stick the whole Alzheimer's thing. I mean, I yeah. like it's, it's this expression that goes around that's kind of tossed around that, like, um, oh, well, MDS is 90% mental and 10% in your mind. I mean, that's kind of like encapsulates how much of it is mental. Um, but it mustn't take away the fact that you do need to have the physical preparation as well. Um, I'm curious on your preparation, helping people for MDS, what typical components do you put in there? How's it broken down? What would they expect if they came to one of your camps? Um, well, if we talk about, I mean, if they come to me as a, as a coach for a race for a longer period, they're then you know we have a relationship over many months and 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 then i have um i have more time um but if we talk about the camp specifically we have um we have arians components there so we do uh running on uh, all different types of surfaces that you will find in the race so that develops your your skill running on those surfaces but it also builds a bit of confidence that you have done it, you know what to expect. And so that's part of the mental preparation. Then we do, um, we do long runs because that's very typical for the race, of course. So we do long runs. People get to test um, all their equipment. Um, and we're also doing um, one day of only walking. So we're taking everybody out for about maybe a six hour walk. And... Um, someone listening now might go, well, why on earth is that? You know, I'm a fast marathon runner. Why should I be walking? Well, it's very simple. In the race, you will walk. I walk in the race. You know, it's it's um, when you when you add the heat, the weight of the backpack and the terrain, um, you slow down a lot and you're going to have to do a little bit of walking. And actually, if you begin to get overheated, the only way... Um, to 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 cool yourself down is to slow down. So if you haven't trained walking, um, you're going to find it very difficult to walk and to walk fast. And also you're going to get blisters because you've never walked in your running shoes or right? you've only run. So then that's a different movement and you get blisters. So that's why we take people for a walk. So um, uh, and, and most people find that very positive as well, actually. So that's good. And then we have... Um, information sessions like seminars where we talk about equipment we talk about foot care you know we talk about nutrition we talk about hydration we talk about what to expect in the race so 
um, yeah, so it's your own experience developing developing your endurance, developing your technical skill and, and gathering information and sort of filtering out what's going to work for you with all of that so that you can prepare all your food and all your gear and everything. And in terms of setting, like, I'm quite big on, for example, marathon runners having an idea of having a target finish time so they can set their target race pace so they don't start off too fast. How do you prepare somebody or is it possible to get a target finish time for something like MDS or do you never know? Yeah, <laughs> it's possible. And, and then maybe we talk about, about time, but maybe we talk about position, like an approximate position is easier than, than time because the course changes every year. Mm. Um, most people find that very, very difficult to do on their own. And because all they see is that they're going to run 250 kilometers in the desert and they think they're going to die. So even if they're a three hour marathon runner, they say, oh, I just want to finish, you know. So everybody has this goal that they want to finish, but it's just not a very constructive goal. You know, it's great to finish, but but it's it's a very big difference between running the race in, say, 30 hours, which you might be capable of, versus just finishing which you can do in about you know 75 to 80 hours right um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and i think it's very important to know roughly what your goal is because um your race will look very different every day depending on how fast you are and you need to plan accordingly with the food that you take you know what times are you going to eat what food so if you're resting in camp most of the afternoon, your food choices might be different than if you're out walking the whole day on the course, right? So it's, it's things like that. Um, so how can you do it? Well, I mean, I, I help people do it because I I have a pretty good idea now um, what, what people might be capable of. And I can base that on their marathon times, um, how they can translate the road marathon time into um, running on trails, running with a backpack, um, if they do a couple of ultra marathons in the lead up, I can look at the results and I, I can get an idea. Um, and then in reality, everybody reacts quite differently to the environment that they are faced with, um, in Marathon de Sable. So, so it can go, it can go either way, but, but at least, yeah, it's possible to get, uh, an approximate goal. Mm. And the mental preparation, I mean, those moments, I suppose the diff most difficult thing for a lot of runners is just not stopping and just not giving up or not collapsing when you get that mm. kind of like um, at night time, just being able to get up the next day and do the next kind of stage. But how do you try and prepare people for that, for that keep going? Uh, so I I like to work with a, with a interim goals. And I, um, so it's it's about gradually breaking down mental barriers and 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 expanding your comfort zone and building your confidence so so of course if you let's say that you're you're someone who starts and and you know you have run a half marathon and that's all you've done okay um then of course you're incredibly worried about running 250 kilometers in the desert but then we break it down and so so as part of your training you will run a marathon maybe a trail marathon you will run a couple of ultra marathons and and by doing that you gradually build confidence that that you can do it and and then you also have to break down the race you know because you're running a distance every day that every day it's it's a marathon or shorter except for one day which is the long day and that long day you can break up in two if you want to so so it's always about making the actual race seem less daunting and then when you you know you couple that with the experience that you've built then all of a sudden you know actually it feels a lot more achievable than maybe what it did before and and that kind of mental toughness it can come from different things it can come from your your training you know your and your training races that you, you pushed yourself through you know having in the back of your head that you did that that you achieved that you know um is one thing it can come from um yeah a lot of people are 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 very mentally strong you know i, I would say majority of i don't know the exact statistics but the majority of people i coach certainly are over 40 and and um you know a lot of people have life experience and life usually makes you tough because shit happens once in a while you know <laughs> 
and uh, and uh, <laughs> so so you have that maybe some people choose to run for charity and and maybe they then do that because they have something that has happened they have a certain charity that means a lot maybe and you know maybe this okay my um you know my dad has alzheimer's or you know my brother died from this or you know i have cancer or you know there's so many stories right so so that gives you the mental strength as well yeah brilliant so i mean there are listening to you there are kind of obviously parallels with even somebody trying to run their first 5k without stopping it's just splitting it down into individual components um, maybe having some kind of mantra or just drawing on life experiences and it can be just as daunting for someone who's never run before you know to run 5k as it is for somebody yeah. who's running yeah. to them on an ultra marathon so there are definitely parallels which i hope people pick up even if they're not going if they're ultra they maybe they're just trying to get a half done or a full done and um, it's all very useful information Brilliant. Okay, so I thought the last 10 minutes, normally I can bring kind of comments up onto the screen, but some kind of dark forces. I don't know what you brought with you, but uh, <laughs> topic me from, something's going on here. So I'm going to uh, ask um, Elizabeth one more question. But in the meantime, if anybody out there watching has got any questions, then I'll kind of scoop down and read out the questions to um, Elizabeth. Um, but until that happens... In the meantime, there's one other thing I wanted you to cover, which was um, recovery during in between the stages. Because you're in like a coffee bean bivouac or something, aren't you? It's not luxury four star hotels, <laughs> as far as I gather. How do you yeah. to recover? Do people manage? I've, I've listened to you talking about so, or other people's sandstorms and all sorts of things. So it's not always a good night's sleep, is it? No, no, it's it's not a good night's sleep. But but it, it's an important uh, question actually because. Uh, when you run a multi-stage race, part of your success and, and, and performance is about recovery. Um, so if you're, for example, if you don't sleep at night, you know, maybe you can cope with that one night. But once you haven't slept for two or three or four nights, it's going to get very, very, very hard. So, so sleep is important. So um, what I do is I make sure that I can have a good night's sleep. So that means... Um, being warm enough um and this you know the mds is not a very cold race but whatever race i do i make sure that my sleeping bag is warm enough um i have something that i can use as a pillow and i have a comfortable enough sleeping mat um then with that i think i have done what i can to sleep then the forces of nature you know they are what they are um so if you get a sandstorm you get a sandstorm but i I'm quite lucky in that I sleep a lot and I fall asleep very easily. So um, if I put in some earplugs and I, I and maybe um, an eye mask uh, and I get down in my sleeping bag, I can probably sleep through a sandstorm. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I guess that comes with the experience as well, doesn't it? You yeah, know, I, I think so. I think so. And then... You know, also, as soon as you come come back to camp, you know, put your feet up if you can get get rest. You know, you can you can walk around a little bit. But but, for example, it's not a great idea to go and stand in the email tent queue in the uh, in the sun, you know, for two hours. That's not a good recovery. So you have to look after yourself. And and this is also where your food choices come in. So. You have a minimum amount of calories that you have to have. It's 2,000 calories per day. You know, I could never run well on 2,000 calories per day. So I take more, which means I carry more weight, but I know I need the food. And, and um, managing your food is, is always um, a balance like that. But so, so don't compromise on, uh, on the food that, that you take. That, that's another thing, I think, for recovery. And, that, yeah. of course, the timing of food, which is a whole other science. But Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so whilst you've been answering that, we've had a few questions come in. There's one from yeah. Nick Tiny, who, who's a runner from Brighton. He's living in Japan now, actually. So, hi, Nick in Japan. But, um, yeah, he wants to know how long is the long run. I think it changes, doesn't it, from year to year? But essentially, what is the long run? Uh, in the in the Marathon de Sable? Yeah. Okay, so, the yeah, the long stage, is, it changes every year, but it's typically between uh, about 80... 
82 to 91 kilometers. So the the longest it's been, I think, is 91. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. And um, so slightly more last, than the same marathons. Yeah. Yeah. The last couple of years, it was about 84. Yeah. So it's roughly it, a double marathon. Does its position change from year to year? Is it always at the end, or can it vary? No, the long stage is is uh, the, the, basically the format of the race is always the same. So you have okay. the first three stages, they are anything from maybe, say, 30 to 41 kilometers. Then the fourth day is the long, the long stage. Um, and that goes over two days. So if you do it in one day, you get a rest day. Otherwise, you can go for two days. And then um, after that, you have a marathon stage uh, on day six to stage five but day six and then you finish with a short charity stage on day seven okay cool um rod duncan has asked um how he's training for mds in april he wants to know how much training or how far he should practice running with a full pack or maybe when that's get into his training oh you know this is a very difficult question because everybody is an individual so there's no set formula to say you should be running you know x miles with so many kilos in your backpack so i'm, I'm not really comfortable um saying that but but what i what i will say is that you know i think you should be pretty comfortable before the race to run with maybe around eight kilos because that should be more than enough um for what you're going to carry and sometimes it's better to do the runs with your backpack in shorter sessions you know like maybe 10 to 15 kilometers rather than your longer runs simply to reduce injury risk and what you can do instead is you can actually do longer hikes you know go out hiking for a few hours with your full backpack because it's less impact on the body um, but good training so hilly hikes for example are really great training i think yeah you're a big fan of the hikes aren't you? you believe that that was testimony to your success maybe in the ultra mirage it's a lot of it is being able to hike because that teaches your feet to accept the time on feet and that sort of mm. thing yeah yeah it's a more <laughs> slightly more gentle training um, yeah Good and one that probably building. a lot of runners don't do, runners probably don't realise, they can, especially for the sort of thing, the ultras, that they can get a lot out of walking and the hiking. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's a good one. Right, we've also got a question uh, from Lisa Shabbos. Um, huge thank you for your inspiration. There we go, Elizabeth. Um, she's 41. She uh, did her first ultra last October, 50 miles, and she's now got a 90 miler in Wales in six weeks' time. Um, she wants to know, again, it's tricky because it will depend on the individual, but more or less, if she's training for a 90 miler, um, how many miles should she be doing weekly in the build up to the 90 miler? I can't answer that because I don't know her her history. And um, um, so so that's that's very difficult. But what I what I will say is that. You know, I think there's always a danger in, in trying to make your long run too long, um, if anything. And so I would advise against that. And, and that I think it's normally better to keep longer runs to sort of um, maybe not more than 20 or 20 and a few miles, actually. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps instead do a back to back weekend or something to get, you know, some uh some running on tired legs but but i would advise against very long runs um and other than that you know the training must be must be uh adapted to her previous experience and and the ability and the mileage that she's used to so it's actually impossible for me to say if she should be running yeah. 30 miles think, a week or 100 yeah. miles a week you know but of course the more she can do the easier the race will be but but she has to be able to do that safely so yeah, I think you've answered the question well in saying I can't really say. But that's an interesting point. I mean, we always say you don't have to run a marathon in your training one to do a marathon. And obviously, yeah. Yeah. it's even more true if you're talking about you don't have to run 260 kilometers if you're going to you know, do a race at 260 kilometers. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, like you said, doing back to back runs or recreating that fatigue level um, in other ways. Um, rather yeah, than I mean, it's. I think it's really important to... You know, maybe what I will say is I think uh, maybe the, the peak week should be maybe five, 
five weeks out from the race or something like that, just to give enough time to recover. And I, not everybody are fans of, of taper, but I found, found that a good taper works really well for me personally. So I think it's always better to be fresh and maybe slightly undertrained on the start line than being, you know, overtrained and, and having niggles and being, you know, potentially fatigued. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so at least don't schedule any heavy training in the last three weeks. Just, you know, be prepared to have done the work by then and, and to ramp down. Yeah, yeah. No, good stuff. Um, okay, so a couple more, if that's right with you. So we've got um, Rhea Ben Giza Verniers. Apologies for my pronunciation. If that's I'm... okay. I know Rhea. <laughs> you know Rhea, yeah. Oh, Rhea, sorry. So um, from the Mirage, I think she's preparing. She wants to know your advice for people preparing for the Alt Mirage next October the 5th. So slightly different terrain, although it caught you by surprise, didn't it, this year, even though you came fourth or first overall. What sort of, what are the differences with the Mirage? A bit more technical, is it, or...? No, the Mirage is not technical, um, but if the course stays the same, which I think it will, uh, it's um, it's going to involve um, a fair amount of sand and uh, mixed in with tarmac, and it's uh. fairly flat. Um, so the, the, the preparations for Ultra Mirage would involve um, some normal road running, uh, sand running, um, I, or off-road running, um, but but preferably sand because you know it's it's just we talked about that you get fatigued. It's a different type of running, um, and um, also acclimatizing to heat before the race, unless you're already living somewhere hot. And I have a blog on my on my website elizabethbarnes.com, and it's called How Runners Can Acclimatize to Heat, and that everything you need to know is is in there. But yeah, I think that's that's incredibly important. And finally, with Ultra Mirage, I would say it's um, you know it's hundred kilometers nonstop. It's hot. It's desert. Um, it's a, it's also um, a challenge when it comes to hydration and nutrition. So practice um, strategies for eating and drinking. Uh, a lot of people, I think, suffered um, in that race with, you know, some upset stomachs and, and maybe mm. difficulty eating and feeling a bit, you know, nauseous. And, and, and so that's important as well. That was it. I remember now. It wasn't the, um, it wasn't the, the technical route. It was, didn't it surprise some runners the fact it's a bit more sandy than they had been told from previous years at the Alton Mirage? Was that the one or...? Yeah, it was a different course uh, last year because of uh, because of rains that that apparently fell just before the race. They changed the course, and it wasn't as much sand as um, we had uh, this year or last well, last year. So um, that was probably a surprise. And I, mm. you know, I would recommend uh, running with uh, desert gators as well in the race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, look, there's um, there's been another question. We've talked about um, nutrition a certain amount. Again, it will depend on the person. You've already just said try it out. You know, get everything sorted out before the actual race day. So you know what your stomach handles and doesn't handle. And that goes for marathon runners as well. Don't mm. suddenly try some new gel that someone's given you from a tent on the day of the race. <laughs> <myself>. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. what's it more than running? Um, so I think. <laughs> Um, I think that probably wraps it up, actually. Um, there's so much um, information in there. I understand now why on some podcasts they do notes afterwards, because um, I think I may do it in this case, because you've given us so much great information. Um, for people who need more information or want to follow up, it all seems to be very available on your website, doesn't it? Yeah, so I, I have a lot of blogs about various things. I mean, it's probably probably the most... The, the blog with the most information about Marathon de Sable, so it's elizabethbarnes.com. Um, I have blogged about other races, I've blogged about acclimatizing to heat, a little bit about health, about some adventures I've done in Nepal and other places. And um, and I'm always happy to write things. I quite enjoy running, uh, running, writing, even though I, you know, I sometimes struggle with time. But but I'm very happy for people to to contact me and say, oh, you know, could you? write about this or I really want to know about that and and it's it's um it's always easier for me to also to answer things in more of a public forum or write a blog than answer individual questions because I don't really have have a lot of time for that but if people would like you know one-to-one -one with me I offer consultations as part of my coaching so you can sign up for Skype calls and you know ask whatever you like if you're preparing for a race or you know whatever it might be um so yeah 
Fantastic. So that was Elizabeth Barnes with no H. Okay, it's the Swedish Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yeah. Barnes. Yes, with S and no H. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you must be probably tired of that. Uh, people oh, it's okay. That. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much um, for giving up your time on a Sunday morning. Um, what you've got planned for us today? You're going to be enjoying some of that background behind you, or? I I am indeed, yes. Uh, we're going to go out running, wrecking um, a bit for our training camp. So um, I'll probably be out running for quite a few hours today. Uh, and uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so that's going to take up most of the day and then a little bit of work later on. Yeah. Well, I know that anybody listening to this will, I mean, because I did it the other day, I was pushing my two toddlers in a double buggy and we were against the wind. And if you've got a double buggy and the wind feels the buggy, then it's like you're pushing a house. And you know yeah. what? You entered my mind. I suddenly thought, I said to myself, come on, Elizabeth, you can do this. I actually said, I used your mantra, actually, which I can't say on this. I think iTunes will put us into a, an 18. Oh, book. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you guys, yeah. if you want to hear the mantra, you can go and listen to the last podcast I was on with Ian Corliss. And we'll talk yeah, you can hear the mantra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't say on this one. I'm, I'm not popular enough to be able to use that sort of language here yet. But, um, yeah, so I'm sure uh, anyone out there for the next few weeks, will your name will be crossing their minds if they're pushing against the elements. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to sign out with everyone now. So you're going to disappear, but then I'll come back and say thank you in a couple of minutes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Matt. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll talk to you in a second. Right then. That was amazing. Um, brilliant. As not better than I thought it was going to be. Um, I sincerely hope that you have uh, got some great gems from that. Uh, like Elizabeth said, if you're, for those of you serious about ultra running and maybe doing the Marathon Sabler, then you've got the website, ElizabethBarnes.com, um, and you can contact Elizabeth. She's more than happy to give out advice um, and information, as she said. Thank you to all of you for listening today and thank you for uh, the feedback we've been receiving. As you know, we're a podcast now as well as the video live broadcast. So you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and Podbean, who hosts us um, we're all over the shop. So apparently that's what you need to do. Um, the most important thing is if you did enjoy today, then please head over to one of those sites, especially iTunes, and just leave a review or leave a rating because that's what kind of pushes us up the list. We don't get money out of the list. It just means that the higher up we are in the reviews and the lists, um, the more people get exposed to us, which means we can put out fantastic information like Elizabeth's uh, to more people, which is what we do it for. So once again, thank you to Elizabeth. Thank you to all for listening. Um, and we will see you. Um, what's next week? You will have to follow us on Instagram and Facebook to find out. But we've got some fantastic guests coming up. Thank you once again. And we will see you next time. You're listening to Run Chat Live podcast putting the evidence back into running injury and performance. You're listening to Run Chat Live podcast, putting the evidence back into running injury and performance.